Thank you very much, Professor Hilusman. Uh, now we will have a uh, Q&A session, so please figure out, think about the questions that, uh, that you might have. So, please. We, have, uh, we will have two microphones uh, circulating in the room, so please raise your hands and enlist for, for questions. Let's hear for the first question. Hello, uh, Adrian Panaite. Uh, I'm journalist, uh, Courier National Daily Business Paper. Um, you have uh, yesterday, Professor um, Tyler Cohen had a message for Romanian. You haven't in the current speech, so I'll force you to have one. And uh, I don't want you to be polite. I want to, you to be rude. And uh, my uh, question is about the monetary policy in Romania. Um, I. Um, quite annoy uh, the representatives and the, of the central bank because at the very uh, presentation and the conference after the pre uh, presentation of uh, inflation report, I asked them uh, not about eggs uh, or uh, uh, some different prices, but I asked them about the real inflation, the increase of money supply and the credit. Uh, this is the context in Romania since uh, 2008, uh, after the financial waves of uh, crisis hit uh, Romania. Uh, we had, uh, until now, an increase of the money supply M3 by a third, even though in the very same period of time um, we had a contraction of the real GDP by 10% uh, in these four years. Um, the representatives at the central bank says that uh, inflation uh, have correlation with money, money supply only long term and uh, that uh, is not, we don't have to worry. They said that it is a deficit of aggregate demand and so on and so forth. What should we do? What should we tell? What, what, uh, how you see this? I think the, the, the first thing that I would stress always is, is uh, uh, the, these Cantillon effects that I uh, talked about, right? This is a necessary consequence of increasing the money supply. You create winners and losers. So I think for, for this reason alone, such a policy that uh, boils down to increasing massively the money supply is, is condemnable. And right? it's, it's, it's glaringly, it's, it's, it's unjust. I mean, what, what is the ground for obtaining revenues at the expense of other people, or no other grounds, that the central bank increases the money supply? And especially, I mean, you really have a redistribution in favor of the rich, uh, who are usually closer to the financial markets and uh, to the detriment of, of the poorer uh, people who are usually removed from financial markets. Uh, so this is for, I think this is the first thing I would stress. Uh, in my seminar in Paris, I recently had a, a distinguished uh, director of the Banque de France. He was not aware of this. And when, when we presented him, well, so this is, this is the consideration, these are Cantillon effects, he never heard about this. And he outright rejected this. Well, this is, this is not true. This is, what he really meant is, wow, well, this cannot be. <laughs> uh, this shall not be true. But it is. Right? You cannot prevent this kind of redistribution. It's very, very unjust. So this is the first thing I would say. So even if there is no immediate impact on the price level, and if it's true, right, and, and sometimes it is true, right, that the impact on the price level is only in the long run, you always get this redistribution effect. So for this reason alone, right, massive inflation of the money supply is condemnable. And then I would say, well, in the long run, you not only get um, a higher price level, but you also fragilize the economy because what they are doing is to create incentives that de-responsibilize uh, financial intermediaries and the market uh, participants uh, at large. Right? So you create uh, uh, simply the wrong business culture. Right? So these would be my main arguments. It's, it's wrong just to become fixated only on the inflation rate.
as a response to the financial crisis at EU level, uh, it has been created a European uh, financial supervision system. It contains uh, a European um, Council, a supervi supervisory council, and three uh, supervisory authorities, one on banking, one on um, financial markets, and the other one on, I think, on insurance. What do you uh, opinion uh, on this fact? in terms of financial market interventionism, if you can uh, explain this uh, creation from this point of view. Hmm. Well, uh, I mean, first of all, we should underline that uh, it was not the f fact that before the advent uh, since uh, January 2011 of the new uh, system of financial supervisors, we didn't have any regulation of financial markets, right? We, I mean, financial markets have been regulated for decades. So despite all this regulation, uh, the, it came to the crisis. Why is this? It's because the regulation rests always on the surface of problems, right? It concerns completely secondary aspects and doesn't attack the root cause. The root cause is deresponsibilization. If you regulate, say, well, uh, banks, uh, be, be careful, you, you, uh, well, you, you need to have 8% equity and so on, and we forget for the moment that they leave the back door open, right? You buy whatever, only Greek government bonds that you don't have to keep. Uh, uh, keep at 8%, but it, it's still right. I mean, you create incentives for banks knowing that they will be bailed out. You create incentives to go into particularly risky investments where the, uh, the returns are particularly high. Right? So be, financial regulation by its very uh, nature is only partial, right? It always, it always leaves some maneuvering, right? Some liberty to the banks. Right? That's because it's regulation. It's not uh, total, totalitarian bureaucracy. And as long as there is a way out, banks will look for a way out and find a way out. Uh, this is called, and in the industry, the jargon, uh, jargon is called uh, regulatory arbitrage. Uh, you find ways of developing new products uh, that get you around the regulatory requirements. One example is securitization. Uh, securitization did not exist before the 1990s. Why did it come into full swing? Well, because we had Basel I. Basel I required uh, companies to keep 8% equity, except on uh, securities issued by trustworthy uh, OECD banks or by governments. So the OECD banks started to set up special investment vehicles right, that, that issued uh, securities covered by uh, high-risk uh, underlying assets. So banks didn't have to hold a lot of equity. Right? So it's, it's a way of getting around the regulation. And you cannot prevent this, right? Unless, right, uh, the, the only way really to prevent this is no longer to regulate the financial markets, but to have everything run by the bureaucracy, impose a, a complete set of prescriptions on how banks should use their money, then you can r rule this out. But of course, then you have killed the market, right? You've k created stability by killing the market. It's no more market. So the, the, the thing to do is not to think too much about financial regulations. It's the wrong approach. What these people really want is to keep the show going and just reassure a few uh, electors, right, uh, citizens, a uh, few uh, financial market participants, well, things will go fine in the future because we have now other regulators. What they really want is to keep the show going as before and hand out enough money to the government. That's the real idea. So the, the thing to do would be to responsibilize uh, the market participants. And the, the easiest way, the most straightforward way to do this is to get rid of central banks. Right? To kill the central banks, then everybody knows, well, there's nobody there to bail us out. Uh, it's not possible, right? For example, if you're on a gold standard or on a silver standard, you cannot increase the gold standard by one third, <laughs> right? From, from January 2011 to January 2012. It's impossible. So, and because everybody knows this, everybody starts behaving accordingly. Thank you. Okay, can I, because I will act as a central, as, as a state now, having two, two sides. First of all, as a user of funds and also as a producer of capital, fake capital. So I use the microphone to put you a question. Okay, you discuss, to address your question, you discuss about the use of uh, the, the fact that uh, today the companies are financing their operations mainly by their sales volume. Okay, but this sales volume, it is directly connected with the consumption. 
I will sell something if somebody will consume what I'm selling. So you suggested that the consumption is not relevant as the savings are relevant for growth of business sector. Hmm. So in this case, I saw a little contradiction between these two, two uh, statements, hmm. okay? Yeah, well, uh, of course, ultimately all uh, investments depend on savings, or more precisely, the kind of investments that you make depend on the, the kind of things that consumers are willing to buy ultimately, right? But the volume of investment can be a multiple of the volume of consumer spending. Right? And this is what, what we saw in the, let me just hop back, right? that's what we saw in the, the, initial, in the initial chart. Yeah, one of the few, the few initial things, right? Da, 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 da. Yeah, let's look at this. Right. So you see here, right, total investment expenditure, and I, I highlighted this, right, is uh, almost four trillion euros, so it's more than double than consumer expenditure in Germany. And the reason why it can be more than double is because uh, right, is the, we have something like a structure of production, right, spread out in time. So it's not the case that consumer spend all their money on uh, companies that are only in the consumer goods industries, right, but they are companies producing intermediate goods and companies that are producing intermediate goods needed to produce intermediate goods. There are companies uh, that produce fixed capital machines and so on, used by intermediate good producers and consumer good producers and so on. So, on. so all of these companies have revenues that ultimately depend on consumer expenditure. But what the consumer expenditure does is just to give direction to the type of things that you produce, not the overall volume. Uh, this, this is a famous uh, statement by, by John Stuart Mill, uh, right, that the demand for products is not the demand for factors of production. As exactly, this, is, this is a lesson of classical economics that should be remembered today, maybe also taught today. Right? So I encourage all teachers to read this, uh, this essay of John Stuart Mill again, and, and, uh, which, which is verified by, by these figures. I right? just, just need to look here. Right? This, right? The, the demand for, for products is in volume much lower than the the demand for factors of production. The demand for factors of production is a multiple in all developed economies of consumer spending, of consumer demand for consumer goods. Okay. Professor Hussman, I will dare you with an unsophisticated question but I won't mind if you give me a sophisticated answer. Um, there is a custom in Romania, I don't know if it's generalized in the Christian world, whether it be Western or Eastern. Um, after a while, uh, I don't know if it's about a year after a child is baptized, uh, there is a custom in which he is put in front of a large plate on which they are put some things after which, um, uh, depending on which choose on them, uh, his future is said to be shaped. Um, suppose that we have a plate with three banknotes, at least three banknotes, one dollar, one euro, one Deutsche Mark. Please ignore the fact that uh, the plate is made by silver and its handlings are made of gold, and please ignore the exchange rate among these banknotes. Please give me what's your advice for the young child to pick. Thank you. That's, of course, a difficult question, but of course, as, as, a, as a German, I would say, well, I'd rather bank on the, on the German mark, right? So if ever there was a German mark to come back, yeah, that, that would probably be the, the best future on which I would bank the, uh, the future of the child if it could not be banked on, uh, on, a, on a natural money, right? The, the other question is how likely would such an outcome be, and I, I, I would regret to say that the likelihood is, is, is very dim because uh, 
Germans, out of all people, are actually very enthusiastic supporters of the European unification, or political unification progress, uh, and uh, are willing to go to great extents to, uh, to save the euro. So, so far for the future of the Deutsche Mark. There was a question over there. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you uh, three little questions. Uh, first little question is, uh, who is the real leader of a country, the, uh, the financial market or the government? This is the first question. The second question, uh, as a coin has two parts, wait, wait, wait. I, I didn't get the first question. who is the real leader of a country, the financial oh. market or the government? Okay. Uh, the second question, as a coin has two parts, I never seen, and the, here is the question, if you, do, if you do not think it will be interesting to analyze the financial markets from the point of view of creditors on, on, what, on one hand, and from the point of view of debitors, of individuals on the other side. And the second question is, as uh, if it is smoke here, there are some signs who announce that there is a smoke. Why there are not signs, some uh, um, lights who signal when a crisis arrives? Uh, I don't think the crisis was a very big surprise for someone, and I want to ask you which are the, those who benefited from this crisis, the financial crisis? Okay, well, let me maybe start with the, with the third question first. Uh, yeah, I mean, a crisis is, is sometimes, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to anticipate. Uh, I mean, if you just look at the fundamentals, then you might say, yes, I mean, we, we are in a fragile situation, so a crisis could break out any moment. And there are actually strong forces at work to disequilibrate uh, the economy. And that was the reason why uh, I, for example, but I was not the only one, right? I said, well, we are heading toward a crisis uh, uh, a couple of years be before it arrived in 2007 and 2008. Right? So it's, it's possible to just look at these things. What makes it... But, but even my forecast, I didn't date it, right? I didn't say, well, in August uh, 2007, we will have the first companies that they default, and this will alter, ultimately uh, trigger through. The reason why it's difficult to prognosticate this is because all these things depend on the reaction of, uh, of the authorities. Right? If the authorities that intervened in 2007 right, right away, uh, behind the, uh, the curtains, right, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, the public scene, and bailed out AIG and, and other companies that Merrill Lynch that were in difficulties, I mean, the, the crisis would have been protected or the outbreak of the crisis would have been protected for another few months or maybe for another few years. And it's difficult to anticipate uh, these things. What we can say is objectively, we are in a very fragile situation. So more and more drastic measures have to be taken to save the day. What we cannot prognosticate is, will these measures be taken? Right? Or we can only make a guess. I guess yes. We will take more and more drastic measures and we will throw all constitutional constraints overboard, everything that is the fruit of hundreds of years of uh, the involvement, uh, evolution of the legal code. We will throw this over, overboard just to save the day. But this, this is just my guess. I might something else that will happen. Uh, so this is, this is the difficulty here. So who is profiting from it? Well, uh, governments and their, their debtors. These are the, excuse me, and their creditors. Right? Governments and their creditors. Now, who are the creditors? <clears throat> we always say well, it's the banks. Yeah, but again, we need, in the case of the banks, we need to keep in mind that the banks actually do not own a lot of capital. Again, my bank owns 4% equity. Right? The owners of the bank own 4% of all the money that they invest. Who owns the rest? Well, it's, for example, me. I, I'm a bank customer. Right? And other people who have lent money to the bank. And that's the, the way also why they smuggle the, the way through uh, the, the present difficulties because whenever the government says, well, you have to pay, then, then they, they re, uh, reply, well, what do you mean you have to pay? We don't have any money. And you tell us we should have 8% equity, but we have in reality we have 4 So if we have to pay, it's not us who pays, it's our customers who pay. Do you want to have the citizens pay and then get a, re a revolution tomorrow? That's the response of the banks. And that's why the governments always give in. 
Okay. The first question, this brings us to your first question, right? Who is ruling the, uh, the world? Who is ruling the country, financial markets or governments? Well, uh, at present, uh, to a very large extent, uh, financial markets, right? But, I mean, we have to recognize it's the government themselves who brought themselves into this position. And if you take out money from somebody and you make yourself dependent on, on these guys, well, I mean, then one day you are dependent. You are very strongly dependent. So it's not something that falls out of the blue sky. It's not something that comes from the market. It's something that comes from, from the state. The state has itself overexposed to this and has made itself dependent on this. And now the very same persons, often the very same persons, the very same individuals, complain. I say, ah, oh, this is so unjust, right? I mean, it's no longer the politics, no longer the people that decide the fate of the country, it's the financial markets. Well, you are responsible. You did this. What was the second question? I, the point of view. Save us. Oh, you mean you mean the, the, the point of what was the point of view on the present crisis of the saver? Hmm. You mean from the usually it's made from the point of view of the intermediaries. Yeah, uh, I agree. That's just one weakness. Uh, um. mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay. Uh, I mean, part of what I did tonight was uh, the first attempt to, to get closer to this because, uh, for example, one thing that I did was to highlight who are the net savers, who are the net users of savings, right? or to distinguish this. Because financial intermediaries are really just, just in the middle. So who are the ultimate... Uh, people who provide savings, who are ultimately responsible, because that's what they are. They ultimately, if all profits and all, lo uh, especially the losses, will fall on them. And who are the beneficiaries? Sir. Yeah. I saw that Japan has a much higher, uh, you know, proportion of government you know, uh, borrowing than the rest of the countries. I think the um, explanation is that it experienced something like we had in 2007, 2008, like 20 years ago, the lost decades. Uh, what's my question? Will the other countries go uh, Japan's way in the next decade and, uh, you know, start accumulating uh, multiples of uh, GDP in public debts? And uh, the second question is, if the rest of the countries go Japan's way, where will Japan go next? Well, and, I mean, uh, like yeah. the third question, uh, how long would it hold? Because from my point of view, uh, the bigger the public debts, the more fragile the system becomes. Hmm. The higher, you know, the leverages and I think it will collapse at some point and they won't be able to hold it together. Yeah, that, that's, uh, yeah again, that, that's a difficult question that I cannot really answer, but just maybe to highlight a, a few points. Um, it, it, it's not possible for every country to go the, the way of Japan, of course, because, I mean, here we just see the, the use of financial markets, right? So it's not the overall capital market, uh, uh, right? You need to put this into relation to how much money is being, uh, how much capital is being used by the, the firms, Right? and how much uh, money is being invested in real estate and, and, and things like this. Right? So you can have a multiple of GDP in government debt. Uh, might be less of a concern if at the same time uh, also uh, the, the, the real investments that you make in, in companies and so on also a multiple of GDP, which is in fact the, the case. Right? And on the other hand, you might have a country in which that is not the case, right? in which the economy is very primitive, let's say Zimbabwe or something like this, Right? So in, in Zimbabwe, the investments are probably not a multiple of GDP, it's probably equal or similar to, to GDP. If then Zimbabwe heaps up such uh, Japanese figures in public debt, that's, uh, that's a, a different problem. Right? So you cannot, just from these figures, derive, I mean, uh, right, is this a natural limit for all countries to go? You need to put this into relation with other uh, structural features 
of, of the capital what, market. What I see in the case of Japan is uh, also non-financial corporations, the, how you call it, the real economy. The, you know, the, this is what is more worrying. It's very low, so they are not investing much in the real economy. It's being, you know, stagnating. Uh, well, yeah, no, um, <clears throat> again, uh, here Japanese companies are very particular. For example, if you look at France, right? Uh, virtually, you, the 66 percent here that we see here, they represent virtually the entire balance sheet of non-financial corporations in, in France. Okay, in Japan, that's not the case, because you, you, what, what you have there is a massive presence of um, uh, what is called uh, hidden reserves in companies. Okay, so this does not represent, right? I mean, the, the amount, let's say this is uh, how much would this be? A, a few trillion uh, uh, yen. Right? Uh, this does not rep represent the entire balance sheet of the banks. They have, in fact, much more capital than that. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me, of the banks, of the, of the companies, of industry and so on. They have much more capital, capital than that. I have one, one single question. Uh, you have two charts on gold, price of gold. One going up, one going down. Why don't you make yourself a lot of money by arbitraging the price. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 you mean me personally? Well, because I'm not a trader, right? So I, I, I either decide to sell or I de decide to buy, and that, that's it. So I. But there are people who are doing this. I mean, there are people who are doing this, and uh, in the U.S., I mean, we've, we've seen the charts, right? So there were people who made a lot of money by just betting in the U.S. market on falling prices. Made a lot of money of this. But of course, since uh, the overall price increased uh, 600%, right, you, you got actually more than 1,000% increase during the other hours, not the trading days of the US market, but during the other hours, you made a lot more money. Right? So it's very interesting. On the one hand, you can make money by speculating on falling prices during US but trading hours. Yeah, yeah. Exa exactly. No, it, it should become th the same, right? Unless, but th therefore I said, right? Therefore I said, uh, unless you have uh, uh, massive price rigging. Okay, I see your point, right? So there might have people, right, who, who bought this uh, massively. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's true. I, I cannot tell you why, but I mean, this chart, for example, this was published uh, a month, month ago or so. I don't, I don't think that anybody looked at this into the, into the whole thing before. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a good question, right? I mean, arbitrage should have brought this this back by simply by massively buying all, all, all this gold. Yeah, it's true. But I mean, again, right? Some people did. Some people did gain, earn massively on that market. A question about the proposals to uh, make a monetary form returning to, uh, to gold as part of a currency basket. There are several proposals like this uh, recently. What is their worth? I, I didn't understand the question. So, a question about proposals to return to gold as part of currency baskets yeah. of other, with other uh, paper, paper monies. Yeah. What is the worth of, of this kind of proposals? Yeah, it depends. I mean, uh, to, as a shorthand, we always speak about the gold standard, but in fact, there are, well, probably an, uh, an uncountable number of possible institutional arrangements that could somehow involve gold, right? So you can have a gold uh, standard in the form of a gold circulation of coins. You can have a gold standard in the form of a bullion standard. So uh, you, you can redeem paper money into gold, but only if you buy uh, for 30,000 euros or 40,000 euros at once. Right? Uh, and, and so on, right? It can be a Bretton Woods system in which there was only indirect redeemability, right? And of course, uh, the, the further it gets away from actual circulation of gold coins, uh, the less interesting that gold standard becomes from the point of view of reforming financial markets and uh, uh, controlling rampant government uh, spending, right? So the, the, the more lax uh, the gold standard is, the more it resembles something like the Bretton Woods system or Maybe something only that has been discussed recently by, by Robert Zulik, who was the, the president of the, of the World Bank. He said, well, it should somehow be included. 
this is, is fairly vague. I mean, some of it included can mean all kinds of things, right? So I mean, this, this wouldn't be a real constraint. Right. So what is interesting only for reform is uh, the actual use of a different money. Therefore, I'm, I'm also personally less sympathetic toward, uh, first of all, imposing uh, a standard. I think it would be better to have currency competition. Uh, and second, I'm, I'm not convinced that gold would necessarily be the best money. I think the, the best money would, the traditional money in, in continental Europe would be silver. This is the better money as money. And silver can be controlled directly by, by the population, right? Everybody can own at least a few grams of silver and so on, right? So you're dealing with this and you have direct control over this. Yeah, uh, last question, yeah. Actually, okay, so we have two, last two questions. The gentleman with the, the microphone now, okay. So my question is, do you think that the reason because the system is stable is that uh, all these countries collude and they all can sustain similar amounts of debt and the system becomes more unstable when countries play one's pain against others gain like Greece and Germany? So is collusion between all these developed markets and increasing money supply one of the reasons that the system is stable still? No, no, no. I, I, I think, uh, if, if, for example, if Germany now went along with the propositions coming from, from the French government and gave in to the financial demands of other governments that also would like to have more money, the system wouldn't become more stable, it would become more instable. Right? So the, the reaction, the, the, the stance of the German government creates more problems right now in the, in the short run, but ultimately it's a, it's a stabilizing factor. Yeah, that was the second question. Yeah. Okay, Professor, I would like to, to ask you, in your opinion, how would you explain the, the occurrence of an economic crisis? And I'm asking this because I know that you, you have a little different theory regarding the structure of production, so the, the general thinning of the mm. structure of production. Uh, but this would be a problem because people did not change their uh, time preference, right? So um, you say, I think, if I understood correctly, that there is more than one senior Right, so you have multiple cases. Hmm. Uh, in that case, uh, does the economic theory regarding cycles work or do we have another explanation for that? No, uh, I, I think you can still apply the traditional uh, Mises Hayek theory of the business cycle, right? I mean, I mean what, it's true, what I showed in my paper was that uh, actually the, the length of, of the structure of production uh, diminishes if the interest rate uh, uh, diminishes. Uh, but, of course, what you also get is, is, is a rebalancing, right? So, so the higher stages of production still have a higher volume than the lower stages of production. So if you get an artificial decrease of the, of the interest rate, right, you still get the phenomenon that is being described in uh, the Austrian business cycle theory, right? Uh, on top of this, I would, uh, and this is also something that I've done today, right? I would stress the phenomenon of fragility. And that is particularly important to understand why financial markets are so crisis prone. That's because they are fragile. Even if there's no particular disequilibrating, like intertemporal disequilibrium coming from like the scenario described in Austrian business cycle theory, there can be the fragility. It's a phenomenon of fragility. Right? The whole system as a whole becomes increasingly dependent on uh, the, uh, the soundness of each individual element. If you have a robust economy, then individual elements and even larger segments can go bust, but it doesn't affect the system as a whole. Right? We have a fragile system. That would be my uh, main addition to uh, the Austrian explanations of the business cycle of the present crisis. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a good night.